Hello everyone, it's Lewis here and this is the first of many videos that you're going to have to watch um, and it's serving really to be a supplemental video to the slideshows that I've put up online in your case-based learning folders. This one is to go alongside the bone form and function slideshow and basically what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be going through the slideshow with you real time. Um, I'm going to be picking things out off here that I think are particularly important. Um, and it's not so much that I'm doing a lecture on it, I'm rather talking around it, expecting you to have looked at the slideshow and to have read all the bits that are in the notes section of, that, of the slideshow. And then my job here is to pick out all the little bits and bobs that I think are really worth talking about and to where I need to elaborate on them a little bit using my handy dandy drawing pen and stuff like that. Okay, so uh, slide two, which is the, the one after the introduction slide, where it's just got a nice skeleton on it saying bone form and function. Um, this is the one that has got the overall picture of well, this thing. That thing and some text by the side of it. So, okay, first little bit. Bone is an incredibly dense connective tissue. Right, okay, good. That's nice and easy. Um, what does it say next? That it is very hard. Okay, it's a hard substance. This is one of the hardest structures in the body. But then we get to a little bit of the good stuff where it's pointing out that bone is elastic so it is hard and elastic and that it's actually the structure and composition of the bone together that give it these properties or as i like to point out the musculoskeletal physiology is where form and function come together so elastic what does this word mean what is the definition of elasticity? Well, there's some really fancy definitions of it, but basically um, the easiest way to think about what elasticity is, comma, is that it uh, 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 something has got an elastic property if it can deform and then return to its original shape. So deform and then return. So I can just draw a comedy bone, like you'd seen a Tom and Jerry film. We're talking about the ability of our bones to bend, not break, and then rebound to their original shape. So what is causing this ability to deform and then return to their original shape? Well, the answer is all of the things that we're going to talk about over the next few slides. So let's just get rid of this and create a bit more space. So remember, they're hard, but they're elastic. What does that mean? Well, it means they can deform and return to their original shape. Cool. Let's go to you two. Okay. So next thing we start talking about is the periosteum and the endosteum. And these are the layers of bone. Periosteum and endosteum. So the periosteum, which is this little bit of make that go away, this little bit of bony goodness over here has got two separate bits. You've got a fibrous and a cellular layer of periosteum. Okay, so what is this all about then? So the fibrous being the outer layer, okay? The outer layer, so that's that little bit there. And then you've got the cellular layer inside, which is not fibrous, but rather a bit more elastic okay now um, an important part of this is that the outer layer or the fibrous layer 
is the really hard stuff. And then the inner layer is a little bit of um, what starts to contribute towards giving bone some of this elasticity. So the note section says that it contains osteoblasts. Okay, osteoblasts. And then deeper inside again, in this little bit here, which is actually in the cavity of the long bone, we've got osteocytes. Now we deal with the separate bone cells in a different slide a little bit later on. So that's the periosteum, or the important stuff to, to pick out. So you've got a fibrous bit on the outside, and on the inside you've got an elastic layer. The endosteum, so let's just get rid of this stuff. Let's get rid of that, so we're not drawing attention to anything. The endosteum on the other side, that's this wee bit over here, is basically your thin layer that lines the, the, and then you've got an osteoclast there. So you've got a thin layer that lines the cavity of your long bones. Okay, so the endosteum is best thought of as basically a thin layer of connective tissue. That's it, okay? Now, if you make the mistake of going through some very, very, very prolonged malnutrition, you will actually start to eat your endosteal layer, and that will change, because don't forget, we've got form and function coming together. It will change the properties of your bones. And one of the major things is that you will lose the thickness of your bone, the cortical thickness will reduce. Okay, so if we go back to our comedy, Tom and Jerry bone, you could think of it as being the cortical thickness, the actual shaft of your long bone will get even thinner. Okay, which is obviously what we don't want. Okay, on to some other interesting stuff. So chemical composition. Actually, I'm gonna leave that form and function there. So chemical composition. We will, we will get rid of this picture. So, bye. We've got water. We've got an inorganic component and we've got an organic component of bones. So the inorganic is basically mineral salts and the organic is therefore bone cells and osteoid, osteoid. So dealing with the mineral first. The slides say mainly calcium phosphate resembling a synthetic hydroxyapatite. All of this stuff will come together after you've worked your way through all of the slides. Okay, but basically what you need to think of is this calcium, okay, and phosphate, okay, calcium and phosphate. So calcium and phosphate. What does this do? Okay, so the inorganic bit gives bone its hardness. What does this mean? It means it allows bone to resist compressive forces. So why do we need to be able to do this? Okay, well if we draw a little skeleton here. Okay. <clears throat> We've got the weight of gravity pushing down on this all day, every day. Okay. 
I often joke about the fact that when you run a marathon, you can be a little bit shorter than when you finish. And I haven't exactly got a lot of vertical height to lose. So me running marathons is a bit of a bad idea. However, this does give us an opportunity to talk about form and function coming together again. Right, so what does this mean? Form and function come together. The inorganic component, the inorganic component gives us hardness and that allows us to resist compressive forces. If we therefore have a dysfunction of our calcium and phosphate metabolism, we lose hardness of bone and we therefore cannot resist compressive forces. This will then give you changes in your skeletal structure where you get things like bowing of limbs. We will talk about this in separate lectures when we actually just do dysfunctions of bone. Okay, but it's something to keep in mind. The organic components, on the other hand, basically include, as we said, bone cells and osteoid. So with bone cells, we're talking about osteo and then a different bit. So we got blasts, blast because they build. We got osteocytes, site meaning cell. Okay, we've got osteoclasts coming from clastos, which means to destroy. And then we've got osteogenic cells, okay, which are like basically stem cells. And we've got bone lining cells. Okay, the osteocytes, they're basically bone maintenance cells. Okay, so we got bone builders, we got bone maintainers, we got bone destroyers. Okay, and then on the osteoid side, we've got ground substance and possibly most importantly collagen fibers okay so that's relatively straightforward your job i suppose is to just um remember what each of those things is okay osteoid i haven't really gone um on what the ground substance is because it's basically, I suppose the best way you can think about this is that this side, the inorganic, the inorganic side of things um, gives the bonus hardness and then the organic side of things gives it its elasticity. Okay. Lovely. Okay. So on slide 11, we do a little bit of talk about collagen. What is it? It's tough. It's pliable. And basically, it takes one for the team. Now, when I say it takes one for the team, this is to give you an idea of the fact that this collagen is, or a nice easy way to remember it, it is type 1 collagen. There is a different type of collagen, which is type 2 collagen. In your bone, you have type 1 collagen. And you remember this because the collagen takes one for the team. Okay. Ground substance. Um, this will be covered extensively when we talk about articular cartilage. Okay. Um, because what we've got in ground substance is two things. We've got glycosaminoglycans and we've got proteoglycans. Okay, um, what are they? They're basically bottle brushes. They're bottle brushes that carry with them a negative charge. Okay, and then if you've got lots of negative charge together, it's like taking two magnets and these guys try and push each other apart. Why is that important? I'll talk about it when we do articular cartilage. Finally, 
we haven't really talked about water. Well, okay, what is water? It is a medium for all of this stuff to exist in. Okay, key facts. It's 25% of the total weight. 85% um, of that water is found in the organic side of things. Okay. Lovely. Right. Part two. Um, as you can see, I've changed programs because I recorded this once and my PowerPoint basically fell apart and it couldn't seem to keep up with the writing that I was doing. So we'll give it another go. Um, we're going to be talking about Ostians or Haversian systems now. So this corresponds to slide 15 on the slideshow. Uh, these are the guys. So let me just drag this a bit bigger. Okay, so we are going to be talking about these things. Um, they kind of have this Russian doll effect. So if I draw one like this. Um, we've got this. system like that and in there you've got an artery with a capillary network like that and you've got a vein and you've also got a nerve supply going in as well so straight away you can see that inside the Habusian canal This is moving um, medicine and physiology these days to try and rename things away from people. And now this being this is being called a central canal, um, and I'm I'm deeply unhappy about it because I think that it should be it should be credited to this chap. If I can just get his picture brought in, there he is, Clopton Havers. Um, he was the guy that discovered all of this and I think that we should be crediting these people so it's a Haversian canal it's an Haversian no it's a Haversian canal um, and as you can see there's a vascular network in there and there's a nervous network in there and anybody who's broken a long bone can testify exactly how painful it is when you break them some other things that we need to draw your attention to you will see Again, if you just look at the, the little the diagram here, where's my mouse? There it is. That we've got one, two, three ostians there. There's another fourth one there. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and a bit of them drawn on screen there. And you will notice that they are all connected up, and they are all connected up with channels that run in between them and we'll talk about them a little bit more in a second when we change diagrams but there's other things i need to draw your attention to and it's not drawn on martin's telling me he's online let's just make him go away um they're all connected up as i said and there's some other things i need to draw your attention to the first one is and it's not drawn on there but you have got running along your lamellae collagen okay and it runs along it like this now i want to draw this a little bit better draw your attention to it so you've got first thing the gap in between a lamellae is called a lacunae. So this here is a lacunae, that there is a lacunae. Inside those lacunae are osteocytes. Okay, osteocytes occupy the spaces in between the lamellae okay so you've got osteocytes 
which are in the lacunae and the lacunae are the spaces between lamellae is that a double l second guessing myself yes it is thank goodness for that so going back to our collagen what you'll find is that the collagen that runs on this lamella will run in this direction and then in the next one the collagen will run in this direction this allows the osteans and therefore the long bone of which they are a part to resist twisting forces the way that i have got generations of students to remember and understand this fact is to use unashamedly a dad joke and that is that collagen allows osteans to become twister resistors and i am sorry about that i am sorry that i had to do that to you but there we are right so got that out of the way is there anything i've forgotten to say about this no good on to canals okay so let's just get rid of all of this right canals time for a different picture this one corresponds to slide 17 here we go we have got the ones that we've already talked about so let's just change colors and draw your attention to the central canals okay which i'm coloring in green there and that's the vascular network running through those central canals or the havusian canals there is another one that i need to draw your attention to and that is this guy here volkman's canal let's do this better actually just change colors so that and come making everything correspond so let's do Volkman's canal in orange so Volkman's canal that one there all right so you've got the Haversian canals and then you've got Volkman's canals so what you should be able to see is that we've got a blood supply let's go red blood supply here running along the outside in other words through the periosteum then that is splitting off and it is giving a blood supply to the haversian canal then from the haversian canal into volkman's canal so we've got a blood supply coming across like this as well and then that is working its way is working its way all the way into the central canal of the actual bone so the medullary cavity of the long bone itself so what this should be telling you is that everything is connected to the point of not even just the blood supply Okay, which I, which we've just shown that via a system of Haversian canals and Volkmann's canals taking blood supply to the medullary cavity inside the long bone itself, but also the actual cellular network of the bone too. So the cellular network of the bone is also connected. And that is done or achieved, I should say, through a system shown on slide 18 called 
can you lick me? Now, as we already said, the the osteocytes the osteocytes are inside the lacunae which are in between the lamellae so the osteocytes are in the lacunae which are in the lamellae all right okay so let's draw your attention to what we're looking at so these guys are your osteocytes and you can see that this is one lamella that is one lamella and that therefore is the lacunae in between those two lamellae so the osteocytes are there in between now these guys are joined up remember everything is connected these guys are joined up using cannuliculi. And each of these things that you are looking at here are cannuliculi. Okay? Now, why? What is important about this? Remember, everything is connected. Okay? Everything. Everything is connected. So, why is it important that these cells, which are in between the spaces between the lamellae, are joined up? Well, what they're doing is they are transmitting information from one lamella to another lamella and one lacunae to another lacunae all the way through into the central cavity or the medullary cavity. Well, why is this important? Because it takes information about, sorry, let's get this right. It takes information about stress. So your bone has actually got a mechanism that is going to tell it what kinds of stresses and strains it is under. Not to, not to forget, I should say, not to mention, that it is also permitting um, nutrition and waste disposal from cell to cell to cell. So that is why cannuliculi are important. So what have we got? What have we got to check off? We got the central canals in the Ostean and Horovirsian systems, and then we've got the cannuliculi, which are all transmitting information all throughout the bone. In other words, everything is connected. So then we get on to talking about different types of bones. So now we are on to slide 21. And we've got this lovely diagram here, top of the bone. And you've got the two things that are pointed out to you, which is the spongy bone and the trabecular bone and the compact bone. Now, that spongy bone and trabecular bone are markedly different things. So we've got this other diagram here showing that they have got very different properties in terms of something called porosity okay porosity so what does that mean it means we're talking about how porous something is or how holy something is so you can see on the left here so left and right we've got um compact bone and then we've got trabecular bone here and you can see the osteans in the compact bone and you can also see that it is not very porous and actually the the range that we're usually talking about with compact bone is about five to thirty percent porosity versus trabecular bone which is somewhere in the region of thirty to ninety percent porosity why is this important and um, it's important because one of the major problems of the musculoskeletal system is osteo bone porosis and there is a disease that destroys the very important part of trabecular bone which are these things that i'm sketching out now 
okay now these struts are called trabeculae which is what gives trabecular bone its name now they may look like they are a haphazard structure but they are not they are precisely aligned along lines of force in other words this end of your bone here has all of those trabeculae working all the way through it precisely lined up along the forces that that bone is going to be in contact with now you can imagine the kind of problem that you're going to get into if for some reason your bone remodeling cycle unpackages itself and starts to eat all of these important things that are along the line of force you are going to have a markedly weaker bone now that can happen because of osteoporosis but it can also occur um, because of other issues that you might experience for example a problem with the blood supply to the bone so we're talking now about the stuff on slide 24 where I introduce you to a term called avascular necrosis of your bone it's commonly seen in the head and neck of femur so the blood and that's where the blood supply to the head and neck of the femur becomes compromised so if we lose that blood supply as we've said bone can sometimes seem quite avascular it is not and it requires nutrient supply in order to be able to maintain healthy bone around there if you don't get it then what you end up getting is the bone underneath especially the trabecular bone underneath becomes compromised and it starts to to break itself down necrosis that being the difference between apoptosis and necrosis with apoptosis being planned cell death and necrosis being very much unplanned cell death the next few slides within the presentation talk about the um, calcium cycle and the cycle of calcium homeostasis i'm going to do that in a separate video because uh, i i believe that it deserves to be in a separate video and there's also a lot to talk about with that so for now i'm going to sign off uh, and then i shall join you when you turn on the next video regarding maintenance of serum calcium